Greetings, a push historians. It's Mr. Majewski here coming at you with the very last of our uh, PowerPoint uh, lectures online uh, over the winter break. This is going to be Civil War 1861 to 1865. Now, a uh, word of caution before we begin. I mentioned this in class, but again, uh, this area of the notes, this PowerPoint, is not tested very heavily on the test. So we're going to jump around a lot more than we normally would. Uh, we're going to skip over a number of sections. Now, hey, we still have to cover, so this is going to be a couple of videos long, I suspect. Uh, but ultimately, it's 108 slides, uh, but in reality, we're going to cover largely about half of that, a little bit more than half. Uh, so actually, we're going to begin on slide 7. That's the Union War Strategy. Um, we do need to cover that, of course. I'm going to give you a moment to get caught up. No, no Guinness or Schnitzel appearance for you here today. Uh, they're uh, not feeling up to it. Okay, let us begin. We're going to begin with the Union War strategy. So what's going to be the victorious strategy of the North in order to win the war? Well, you know they're going to rely on their strengths, right? Of course, both sides are going to try to focus on their strengths to help them win the war. Uh, it's going to start out very poorly for the North, for the Union. In fact, for the first couple of years of the war, uh, it's really up in the air as to who's going to win. The North was expected to dominate, to crush the South. And yet, because of the amazing leadership of those generals for the first few years, it's 50-50. Uh, the South keeps winning in spite of all of these advantages of the North. And many people in the North start to question, start to wonder, uh, is it worth it? Uh, should we maybe make peace? Uh, fortunately for Lincoln and the North, uh, they're going to discover some, some, some better generals, some better leaders, uh, and they're going to win some key battles about the midway point that are going to be turning point battles uh, that are going to win this conflict for them. Again, it starts out very poorly, especially in Virginia, in the Eastern Theater, because the war is fought in two areas, in the east along the coastline in Virginia and in the west along the Mississippi River. Uh, so the strategy develops after some initial failures in Virginia. One, uh, they're going to blockade the southern coastline. They're going to cut off the cotton exports completely. The northern navy is dominant. It absolutely controls the south. Uh, now, hey, it takes a while for this blockade to get into effect. There are some leaks, some holes in it at first. But eventually, the northern uh, navy, the Union Navy, is going to control the entire Mississippi River. Uh, they're going to completely blockade the coastline. Nothing's going to get in. Very little gets out. It devastates the southern economy. They called it the Anaconda Plan. The Anaconda, that gigantic snake, uh, like a snake, they're going to blockade the whole coastline uh, to prevent those exports and imports. Uh, they're going to cut them. They're going to control the Mississippi River. That's goal number two for them. Uh, they want to cut the South in half. Uh, they know the South depends on the Mississippi River uh, to get supplies and men across to both sides. If they control it, uh, it's a huge artery, almost like the heart of the South that's in the hands of the Union. Number three, uh, they want to cut Georgia uh, and the Carolinas away from the rest of the country. There's a lot of land, a lot of agriculture there. Uh, they're going to eventually go across that area with armies and really destroy it. It's called total war, where they're going to burn everything, destroy it, so it can't be used by the South again. And then lastly, they're going to kind of crush the capital. Uh, they're going to try to uh, really uh, extinguish uh, the, uh, the South, the Confederacy, the CSA, and the capital. Uh, where the capital exists. Uh, they're going to be ultimately successful. They're going to capture Richmond. Once Richmond falls, the war is going to end. Uh, anyways, that's the strategy for the North. We're going to skip ahead now to the next slide. That is slide 8. It kind of visualizes the, southern strat or the Northern strategy, the Union strategy. Uh, the Mississippi River, uh, we're going to have that blockade. Eventually, they're going to march across to Georgia uh, through the Carolinas, uh, and then eventually capturing Richmond. Uh, ultimately, let's move ahead to slide number nine. Uh, slide number nine designates or notes that, uh, however, originally, before this plan could be implemented, the North had a series of problems, a series of kind of disasters. Because, you know, originally, when the conflict broke out, remember, Lincoln only had these soldiers for three months because he and everybody else kind of felt like there would be one battle, um, and the North would win that, and finally this rebellion would be put down. Well, that battle took place in northern Virginia, between the two capitals, uh, in 1861. It was called the Battle of Bull run. Uh, and uh, two unprepared armies, two unprepared leaders were kind of forced into a conflict, into a fight before they were ready. Uh, and in a shocking result, ultimately, uh, the South was able to win. They were on the defensive. It was slightly easier for them to defend than it was to, for the North to attack. Uh, Stonewall Jackson, that hero who's going to become one of the great generals in our history before he passes away, 
uh, makes a name for himself for the first time in winning this battle, uh, arriving in the nick of time to save the South. Uh, ultimately, uh, following Bull Run, both sides, the Union and the Confederacy, settle down. They realize it's going to be a much larger conflict, a much longer conflict than expected. Uh, and that's when the Union develops their long-term plan to win the war, uh, beginning again with the Anaconda Plan. Again, slide 16 uh, is, uh, we're going to move ahead to, um, and that is, uh, again, the Anaconda Plan. Uh, the Anaconda Plan, again, was uh, one of the strategies, the key sol uh, solutions that the North is going to come up with to win the war over time. All right, the South has to win quickly. They have to get a country in on their side. The longer the war goes on, the worse it's going to be for the South, the better for the North. The North is slowly going to extinguish them uh, and uh, eventually defeat them that way. Again, uh, the North uh, has a series of really poor generals. The South has those dominant generals. Uh, of course, one of the worst generals was a guy named George McClellan, uh, who ran the country, I should say, who ran the Union Army in uh, Virginia uh, for almost two years. Uh, ultimately, uh, these generals are going to be replaced by Grant late in the war. Grant's going to be able to defeat Lee for the, uh, for the final time. All right, folks, we're going to move ahead to, uh, again, to slide 18. Now, you should know uh, one unique feature of this war uh, we definitely have our first metal ships, iron ships. They're called ironclads. Uh, the South uh, developed them to try to break the Union blockade. Most of the Union ships were wood. The Southerners believed they could develop metal ships, iron ships, and they would be able to literally just bash through the, the, the Union blockade. Uh, the Union developed a series of ironclads themselves to defeat the Southern ships. Ultimately, the most famous battle was the Battle of the Ironclads. It was the first time two metal or iron ships fought against each other. That was inconclusive. It was the Monitor versus the Merrimack, uh, the North versus the South. Uh, ultimately, uh, most of the uh, fighting would take place between wood ships, although ironclads did emerge for the first time. It's an example of new technologies uh, that developed in this war for the first time. Uh, let's get to uh, moving ahead here. We're going to move ahead all the way up to slide number, and this is what I told you here. Uh, we can jump ahead to a number of things. Yep, we're going to jump ahead to slide 29 now. All right, uh, for those of you uh, following along on the notes, uh, it's going to be letter C, that's Antietam, uh, September 17th, 1862. We'll give you a moment to get caught up. Okay, Antietam. Uh, Antietam is significant to us because uh, it's considered one of the big turning points of the war. Uh, Lee needed a victory. He, by 1862, he was convinced that the border states uh, were going to stay loyal. Uh, and he needed to make sure, after all of these southern victories early in the war, uh, that England and France would stay out of it. That it wouldn't join, they wouldn't ally with, uh, with the South. Uh, and he knew, okay, I have to make this now officially about slavery. Uh, instead of just, oh, we're fighting to preserve the Union. If I now make it, hey, we're fighting to end slavery, uh, Lincoln knew uh, that, that England, especially England, but also France, uh, couldn't join with the South because the public in those countries, the masses, were so opposed to slavery, they'd never allow their governments to do that. So ultimately, Lincoln needed a victory. Well, uh, Lee re realized, hey, uh, you know, just like uh, the North needs a victory, uh, if we go up to the North and we deliver a crippling knockout victory against them, uh, we might be able to end the war and bring England, England in. So uh, Lee moves up into, uh, into the North. He's trying to head to Pennsylvania. He makes it to Maryland, uh, and then a Union army stops him. Uh, at this battle, the battle is called Antietam, uh, Lee is stopped. He's forced to retreat back into Virginia. Uh, ultimately, even though it's not really a victory, it's kind of a stalemate, uh, because they were able to prevent Robert E. Lee uh, from marching on into the North, uh, the North, the Union, considered it a victory. And Lincoln, uh, because, you know, he, he wanted to issue this after a victory, so it didn't seem like he was a defeatist, uh, like he was desperate, uh, he issued what, what was later going to be called the Emancipation Proclamation. So, because of Antietam, as a result of Antietam, Lincoln now felt comfortable enough issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, because of Antietam, and then because of the proclamation, it's going to prevent Britain and France from joining in the war. They, they just couldn't do it. Uh, their people uh, wouldn't allow it. Uh, the government 
um, you know, couldn't uh, couldn't exist. It wouldn't have been able to survive uh, had uh, had they made that decision. Okay, uh, let's move ahead. By the way, Antietam major turning point for political reasons again, uh, because uh, it leads to the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, and that of course is where we're headed to next. Uh, that is slide 35. Uh, in 1862. Um, Lincoln makes this decision in late 1862, hey, it's time now uh, to make this a much more moral or higher purpose. It's time for the North to have the more moral cause, the higher cause. It'll prevent European nations from joining. Uh, and uh, so, on January 1st, 1863, he issues what's called the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, what it said uh, was that, uh, ultimately, all slaves in conquered territory throughout the South uh, were, would be freed. Uh, if the territory was conquered, uh, those slaves were emancipated. They were granted their freedom. Uh, they were no longer considered slaves. Now, hey, he ignored the whole border state uh, issue. He didn't technically free slaves in the border state. They technically had to wait until after the war was over uh, before they uh, got their freedom. Uh, he didn't want to uh, alienate or isolate the border states uh, any further um, than you know they might already have been. Uh, again, all Southern slaves uh, were uh, declared free uh, immediately once they were under the control of the Union Army. Uh, slaves in border states were not, as slide 37 reminds us. Uh, ultimately, they would be the last slaves to be freed, those in the border states. Uh, ultimately, uh, many slaves were, uh, you know, even after the proclamation, were still in bondage. And here's why. Because these slaves had to wait for the Union Army to show up. Uh, they had to wait for the protection of the Union Army. So a lot of times, uh, even after they heard about the Emancipation Proclamation, slaves still stayed on the plantation until the Northern Army showed up, liberated the area, the people knew they would be safe, uh, they wouldn't be targeted or punished by their previous masters. Uh, we're going to move ahead here to uh, slide 41, a reaction to the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, uh, a lot of folks actually in the North sort of felt like Lincoln might have gone too far. Uh, especially in uh, you know northern cities where the Irish immigrant population was high, uh, desertions actually technically increased. Um, it was politically not as popular as uh, as Lincoln had thought. However, more importantly, he needed to keep Europe out of the war. That's what the Emancipation Proclamation did, even if it made him and his party slightly less popular at home. Uh, however, many abolitionists, of course, cheered it. They were thrilled by it. Uh, this is what they had been hoping to see for decades and decades. Remember, they had considered Lincoln to. Uh, gone back on his previous promises on this issue. Ultimately, they were thrilled by this, you know, Horace Greeley, Frederick Douglass, uh, they cheered it. Uh, Southerners were, you know, reviled by it. They were horrified by it. Uh, ultimately, to them, it confirmed a lot of their fears that the war uh, had been about slavery all along, no matter what Lincoln had said previously. Uh, folks, uh, we're going to jump ahead now to uh, slide 42. Well, I guess we're not really jumping ahead. Slide 43, I'm sorry. Uh, the war in the West, that's the battle, the war really to control the Mississippi River. While the fighting in the East is going on, and early on it went badly for the North, uh, there's fighting out West. That goes much better. Uh, the big reason is because the Western general, Ulysses S. Grant, is in charge. He is going to win a series of victories out there. He's going to control the Mississippi River. Eventually, he has so much success, uh, Lincoln grabs him and says, Hey, you're coming to Virginia. You're coming to the Eastern Theater. I need you to fight against Lee. Uh, but before he could do that, he won a series of conflicts out west. Uh, he took more and more of the Mississippi River uh, throughout 1862, 1863. Um, in, uh, and, of course, the Union Navy uh, helps him, assists him along the way. They took bit by bit, bit. They took New Orleans. Uh, they took much of the New Mississippi River as well. Remember, the Southern Navy is virtually non-existent. It's so small, uh, it cannot provide much of a challenge to the North. Alrighty, we're going to jump ahead now to uh, uh, to number 48. All right, slide 48, the war in the east, Lincoln Lee's last victories, and uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, again, what we're going to see here is actually we're going to jump ahead even further. We're going to jump ahead all the way to slide 54, Gettysburg. All right, uh, folks, uh, after Antietam, uh, after that failed invasion of the north by Lee, uh, that resulted in the Emancipation Proclamation. Lee decides, hey, one last chance, one last time. I need to go up. I need to score a major victory. I need to knock the North out of the war uh, because Lee knew from now on he wasn't going to be able to get the support of England or France. Uh, and so he marches into Pennsylvania. He's able to get up into Pennsylvania to a little sleepy town called Gettysburg uh, where he's met by the Union Army. Uh, the Union Army uh, fights very strongly in this conflict. Uh, ultimately, uh, let's move ahead to... Uh, to slide 
Um, actually, we can stay on slide 54, actually. Uh, ultimately, in a three-day battle with 57,000 casualties, more than the entire American Revolution, um, ultimately, uh, the Union is able to repel this invasion. Lee is forced to retreat. It's a disaster for the South. No longer can the South be offensive. They can no longer invade the North. They're not strong enough. The only thing they can do is fight a defensive war uh, and try to hold on as long as possible. It's only a matter of time. Now, the war is going to drag on after Gettysburg for two more years, uh, but the South has no realistic chance of winning. All they can do is prolong the fight, try to keep the North away from them as long as possible. Ultimately, Gettysburg is the turning point in the East. Uh, it uh, is the major defeat that the North needed uh, against Lee uh, throughout this conflict. Uh, ultimately, uh, after Gettysburg, um, Grant is going to take over and finish off Robert E. Lee. He's going to ultimately capture Richmond uh, and force Lee to surrender. Uh, the Gettysburg Address is a famous speech given by Lincoln following this victory. Uh, many consider it to be one of, if not the most important speech. Uh, he talked about a uh, commitment to the government, uh, how the North was going to win, how the Union was going to be preserved, how it was going to survive, uh, and how we needed uh, to honor both sides in this conflict uh, because ultimately we would be reunited in the future. Uh, folks, out west we have a turning point as well. It's called Vicksburg, so I like to remind folks it's the Bergs that were the turning point. Uh, and they both happened uh, really one day apart uh, in 1863. Gettysburg ends on July 3rd. Vicksburg is captured, conquered on July 4th, on the 4th of July. Uh, ultimately, Vicksburg was the very last part of the river that was controlled by the South. Uh, so they could move supplies there uh, across Vicksburg. Uh, and the Union wanted it desperately. Once they controlled it again, they could cut all the Mississippi River. They would control it. They would cut the Confederacy in half. Vicksburg was a strong, uh, a, like a stronghold. It was a series of forts on bluffs, on cliffs uh, that were almost untakeable. Uh, you couldn't really charge or assault it. And so what, what Grant did here in his last major victory before they moved him to the east uh, is he sieged it. I put him under siege. Uh, he starved these people, both the armies and the population of Vicksburg, Mississippi. Ultimately, they were forced to surrender. I mean, and there are stories of them eating, you know, dogs and horses, uh, horrible, horrible things uh, in an effort to try to survive. Eventually, they couldn't hold out any longer. They surrendered on July 4th. The Mississippi River came into Union hands. Uh, so in a 24-hour period, in the east and in the west, the turning points happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, Lincoln really was celebrated along with his generals. Okay, uh, of course, we're gonna move ahead now. We're gonna move, uh, of course, to slide number 65. Well, folks, following Vicksburg, Grant gets sent to Virginia. He gets sent to the east to fight against Lee. Uh, and a new general takes over for the Union out west. His name was William T. Sherman. Uh, William T. Sherman decided, hey, you know, war is hell, all right? Even though it's going to be brutal, we need to take the fight not only to the southern armies, but to the southern people. Uh, Sherman led the northern armies in a famous, what is called, march to the sea. He marched across the south all the way to Georgia from Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh, and he destroyed, he burned everything he came across. He destroyed southern armies, uh, he burned plantations, he burned their cotton, uh, he destroyed any food products, pigs, pork, cows, anything that could be used to eat or to fight uh, in an effort, again, to try to really destroy uh, the will to resist in the South, to convince them there was no hope. Uh, the only solution, the only choice they had was to come back to the North again. Uh, it was known as the March to the Sea. Sherman was viewed as very brutal, very harsh. However, these tactics become common later on. They become kind of the tactics of World War I and World War II. So in many ways, Sherman was kind of ahead of his time. Sherman and Lincoln uh, used what was called this total war to really break the resistance, the will of Southerners, to force them. They really have no choice at the end of the war. Uh, they were destroyed. The Southern economy was completely decimated, uh, burned to the ground. Uh, and they had to come back to the north whether they wanted to or not. All righty, uh, let's move on, folks, uh, to uh, the election of 1864 because at the time, despite these, you know, clear victories Lincoln was having, uh, there were a series of political issues uh, where he nearly lost his election there in 1864. We're going to hit on that, uh, and we're going to uh, finish up with these notes very briefly uh, in the next video.